let's get started. I'm so excited to be here. Welcome to day two. I hope all of you had a really fulfilling day yesterday. We're gonna have a fantastic time um, today as well. So let's get started. Um, our first panel is casting superpowers, share how they cast a project and what the right cast can do for you. We have some of um, the industry's leading casting directors here for you. Um, so without any further ado, please welcome to the stage um, your moderator for today, my dear friend, Mr. Matt Roden from Broadway.com and your panelist, David Caporaliotis. Did I get that right? I'm gonna, I'm, did I really? I am a genius. That's why they pay me a lot of money. Um, Daryl Eisenberg and the one and only Miss Tara Rubin is here as well. So give them a round of applause um, and enjoy our first session. Morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Yeah. Enthusiastic. Thank you so much for being here bright and early. We appreciate it. Um, thanks to Ken for having us. Thanks, Tyler. Um, we'll let you guys get settled for a second. Um, I don't, I want to skip sort of the formalities, because um, we, we have a limited amount of time. So if you want to know about projects they've worked on or who they are, you guys are programmed, so you can check those out. I want to start by talking about collaboration, because what you guys do, it, collaboration is inherent in what you guys do. So I'd love for you guys to speak a little bit about um, what good collaboration looks and feels like for each of you. David. Your two is right immediately. Well, collaboration is at the heart of theater making in general. Um, it's it's uh, so it, the way in which it uh, works best in casting, I think, is when there is a fundamental level of trust between the creative team and the casting department. Um, and by that, I mean that you trust that our sensibility will be in keeping with the, the, um, the artistic and aesthetic ideas of your piece, that we will understand the tone, that we'll understand the, the, the shades of, of, of color in it, that, which characters are, you know, is it primary colors? Is it pastels? Is it, you know, you know, what kind of people live in this village that we're creating on the stage? Um, I find sometimes that, uh, and, and sometimes since many of you are early career people, I find sometimes with early career artists, there is, um, I have a harder time feeling like I have earned that trust and that there's a sense of that I'm always being tested or that I haven't quite, um, I haven't quite done enough work or um, I trust, that, uh, if you could have heard the conversation that we were having before we started, it was about our caffeine, caffeine intakes and <laughs> how we try to like take it in as much as possible in order to get through each day. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I would say that, that the, you know, that you can trust that we are going to do the job to our fullest ability. Um, so that that's where I see it. Uh, so yeah, just to piggyback on what Tara said, that um, theater is unique in that it is, I would dare say, one of the most collaborative environments. And so it's making sure that uh, the casting is, is has a seat at the creative team table, but also that we are there to fulfill the vision of the director, the writer, the producer. Um, and so many of our early stage conversations are simply about what is that vision? Um, and how do we make sure that we're viewing this piece through the lens you want us to view it through? Um, but also one of the benefits is we are also audience members, so will the audience be receiving that vision that you think we are, we are telling? Um, and many of the conversations I find that I'm having earlier and earlier and earlier in the process are about diversity and inclusivity, um, making sure that this is a story worth telling in 2019. Um, and those are perhaps conversations that when I first started working in casting, interning for Dave Cap, um, I didn't necessarily know we were gonna have as part of a casting process, but are now the beginning of the casting process, the most important part, I dare say, of that process. And that's inherently collaborative because we're talking about fundamental parts of the piece uh, that casting's now helping to lead the conversation on. Um, they're important conversations, uh, but they're happening earlier and earlier and becoming more of the, the foundational work that we're doing for casting. 
Um, I think the nature of the collaboration oftentimes has to do with your history and or relationship with the, uh, the producer that's hired you, the director, the writer. Uh, a lot of times someone like Joe Mantello I've worked with a lot, Dan Sullivan I've worked with a lot. So there's less what Tara's talking about um, trying to get on the same page aesthetically with them trying to understand what my aesthetic is gonna be. Uh, they pretty much know that by this point. Oftentimes we are working with uh, newer playwrights, newer directors who uh, may not be familiar for whatever reason with our body of work, which is fine. Uh, so there's a sort of a dating period at the beginning, except that you're already committed while you're dating to get to know each other and understand how each other works. And I think at the end of the day, what we're all trying to do, Tara, um, when we do these things, always goes back to the word storytelling. And I think if for all of us, for you where you are right now, maybe you're working on a project that you read, that you are passionate about, that you are willing to put yourselves personally, creatively, artistically, fiscally on the line for, what I tend to think of sometimes is all of our relationships to that script. What are our two in the morning thoughts? That playwright was up, that TV writer was up at two in the morning at a computer writing. Then the director read it. Maybe that director read it at two in the morning and has his or her own thoughts about it. Then I do. And it's sort of like trying to bring those 2 a.m. thoughts about that piece into the light of day and all of us get on the same page with it, if that makes sense. Um, and our job sometimes is to help the writer or director, or the writer most often, uh, expand maybe even what they think that they have. Because once they put it out there, it germinates and becomes something else in some ways, even larger than they may have thought it to be. So I think our job is to help them move the borders of what they think it needs to be to what it also could be. And, and one other thing that I always try to keep in mind is that I'm trying to be creatively in service of the kind of collective uh, imagination of the writer and director of the piece. So I'm not there. I, I am trying to get as close to what your ideas are and what your, the story you want to tell, and and I'm in service of that more. I'm you know more than I'm trying to uh, um, have my say necessarily in terms of of who I think the right storytellers would be. Um, sometimes there there is a, a thought or an idea that challenges the the process a little bit, which is healthy and creative but to the for the most part our 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 idea is to is to help you uh you know create this piece and to the best that we can so it's you know we're here for in service of you um i'm wondering what what types of people do you enjoy collaborating with you know what i mean like what does someone bring to a room that makes the process easier or more difficult? Can you just speak a little bit about that? Kind above all else. Um, I want to work with kind people. Uh, so much of what we do, it's it, to piggyback again on the 2 a.m. thing, is these are creative teams that we're going to be talking to at, you know, on Sunday evening, Monday at 6.30 a.m., uh, Thursday when I'm driving to pick up my kid from school. Like These are just, you're going to be talking to them 24 seven, and so are these kind people? Do you cringe when you see their name on your cell phone? Um, and so I think in this world, we time is limited, uh, so kind people. And then I, I seem to find that the kind people are the intelligent people, are the creative people, are those who are telling important stories. That all seems to follow if we start with kindness. So that's what I'm looking for in a creative team and with a story that, do I, do I wanna answer that phone call? And if I do, everything else seems to follow. You know when you go to a restaurant with somebody and how they treat the wait staff is important to you? And you sometimes are with somebody who's so terribly rude that you sort of sublimate your responses and you're like, oh my god, this is, this is a microcosm of how you are in the world. Um, respect for actors, respect for the people that we're bringing in, even if you do not particularly feel that that person is right for what you want, recognizing that that person may be right for something else down the road, and or that that person may indeed 
one day become a box office person who you are then going to need. So treating everybody with the same amount of respect. And I think um, recognizing, I don't know if you've experienced this, but sometimes I feel like uh, directors or writers uh, can be purposefully inscrutable about what it is that they're looking for or whether or not they're responding to the people that you're bringing in. And I think casting directors are very good at reading social cues. It's sort of our job to understand, well, that person's not saying much, but I'm picking up their body language that they did respond favorably. If I had to bet, I would say they liked that person. I'm not sure. Um, but so somebody that's not, that's not precious with what it is that they're looking for um, or hiding it from you like it's a family recipe <laughs> so that we can actually build on what it is that you re are responding to or not responding to because oftentimes we learn as much from actors that the creative team is not particularly interested in uh, so that we can then build our future sessions based on what it is that we think you think you're not seeing. Um, yeah, I think that that's, that's very important, I involving us in in what it is that you're looking for rather than it's say, well, show me what you've got kind of a situation. Um, and again, to go back to the waitering metaphor because I did it for so many years, I would do anything for a table that was nice to me. If you were nice to me, I would get your condiments immediately, I would get you your drinks, free drinks, whatever. If you were not, at a certain point I'd be like, well, screw table 12. <laughs> They're not getting mustard at this meal. Uh, they have worn out my generosity of spirit, you know. So, you know, treating us, treating us fairly with respect and involving us in the process as much as he's fit to give us the information that we need to do what you, what you are looking for. I think. Yeah, I would say um, the the kindness uh, it, it works its way through everything, um, and so if uh, if. Our creative team has a kind of generosity of spirit in the audition room. It's only in their best interest because the actors will, will feel confident and cared for and obviously present their best work. And so it's always been very important to me that uh, we, we treat actors with respect we, um, and with as, as much of a generous spirit as we possibly can. Oftentimes actors are asked to prepare, to learn two originals, you know, two new songs, to prepare 30 pages of sides for the audition. And I, I don't take that lightly, you know, I, I understand that the actor's life is, um, there's a casualization of labor and, you know, that there that there's a tremendous amount that they do that they're not paid for. So I always try to make sure that we're as respectful as possible of what they've prepared when they come in the room. And especially at early stage productions, uh, an audition process is as much as the, as much of the creative team adjudicating the actor as it is the actor adjudicating the creative team, um, because there is not necessarily the huge payoff of being involved in a production at an early stage. Uh, and so having a casting process that is kind and thoughtful, uh, and being aware of the work we're asking the actor to do before they have the job, uh, goes a long way. Um, one of your collaborators in this room, I'm, their audition process always comes out to me as one of the kindest because they brought donuts. Uh, and I dare say we got the first choice of every actor for that process that wasn't paying them a lot of money because we had donuts in the, in the lobby. Um, so being kind above all else I do think is, is the most important. I love that. Um, Joe, you spoke a little bit about this. What do you guys see your role is in the creative process? Because I think sometimes people sort of think of casting as an ancillary thing. It's something that's not inherently a part of it. And obviously, I don't think any of you think that's true. Um, so what role do you feel like you play in, in the building of, uh, of a show? Do you, do you enjoy that piece? It's my favorite part. It's why I think we all do what we do. Um, for me, casting lives in this very special moment of we take what's theoretical and move it into the tangible. Sometimes an audition room is the first time the creative teams all sat behind the table and had to work together towards a goal. Um, so like Dave said, it's a lot of reading the room, understanding the social cues, playing therapist to the creative team often to make sure all the voices are being heard correctly. Um, but it's a, it's a very unique time in the creative process where so much has been on paper or 
in someone's head about what their vision is, and this is the first time it has to be articulated, because we're taking, it could be anybody who can play this to, this one person is going to play it. And that sort of funneling down process and making something real and tangible. There's a physical person standing there who's gonna say those words out loud. I think that's that spark of creation that draws me to this, to this profession. Um, you just quoted um, Stephen Schwartz. Intentionally. Inadvertently. <laughs> oh, intentionally. Um, I think that at the end of the day, what we are trying to do is help facilitate consensus, uh, help build consensus, not force it, not necessarily lead it, but um, help everybody consider, I think, I think the phrase maybe consider before deciding is, is chief among what it is that we do. Uh, helping people, or not helping, but um, facilitating thought. A, a playwright has lived with a character for a long time in his or her head, and there might be a person that the character was based on, or they have created that person in their brain. The director has read the script, hopefully, and has come up with his or her own idea of the characters. The actors, of course, are going to read it, and oftentimes, and when I teach, try to teach actors to read something dramaturgically, to read it for content, for event, for structure, try to approach material like a director would. And then, so they are oftentimes reading the script, of course, through their character's lens. And so I think it's our job in some ways to try to, as Daryl said, take the character from existing up here and filtering the character through all the actors that we're bringing in who are gonna to try to make that character flesh and blood and viable. And hopefully we're bringing in, we're hired for our aesthetic, right? Um, really the only decisions, the final decision even that, that casting directors make is if I have eight slots, what eight actors I am going to bring in. And those eight actors may be different than the eight that Daryl will, or the eight that Tara will. So I'm being hired on the assumption that I'm going to bring in eight interesting, inclusive, specific actors, uh, not all the same, not on one track, but all of whom I think could bring that character realistically to life. Um, and again, build consensus, hopefully with everybody on the team, where someone says, oh, I hadn't thought of it that way, Another person says, yeah, and for a reason. I don't, that's not what I'm interested in. Which is fine, but you tried, you know. And then you winnow in slowly on people that everybody feels collectively, in some ways, match what we've all had in our brains. I, I don't have a lot to add to that. I think both uh, Daryl and Dave have spoken really um, eloquently about that. Um, the only thing I might add is, uh, like, I, I do feel to a certain extent that we sort of um, uh, navigate the ineffable, if that's even possible. But I'm not sure I'm saying that. But there is a certain extent to which there's, I always go like this, there's this part of acting and, and casting and directing, this thing that we can't exactly define and we can't exactly articulate. But it's that part of the, the character that represents the decline of America or the, the way in which the character in some way is the... Uh, explosive energy of the of the the storyline and so making sure that we that the creative team is taking those kinds of things into account also in addition to whether or not the the high sea is floated and the and the you know the the physical life of the character is in keeping but that the the ineffable parts that I think kind of or what we respond to so strongly as an audience members. I would just say one thing too, really quickly. We do this every day and we are used to so many high pressure situations and I think part of our job too is to manage expectations and manage the fact that casting takes time, thoughtful casting takes time. And a lot of times we'll be two weeks out from a two day rehearsed reading and we're not cast and the director or the playwright, if they've not been around as, as long, will be like, oh my God, but it's in two weeks. And I'm like, dude, I have been awake at 
you know, 11.30 at night, the night before a reading, stalking people on Facebook to try to get an actor to come and do this. It's going to be fine. Somebody is actually going to be there behind that table on that day. How many times I write, slow and steady wins the race, guys. Let's hang in there. We're going after the right people. We're doing it in the right way. And recognizing, and this is where the trust comes in, that part of our jobs also are to keep our eye on the time. And to recognize, I think we have, you know, in star casting situations, we have this amount of time to continue to make offers to people who may, in point in fact, have no desire ever to step foot on stage, but the director has wanted them to be in his or her play or TV show or movie since they were 12. <laughs> and so they want to be afforded the opportunity to offer Nicole Kidman a play. And we may know, you know what? Based on my experience, that's probably not going to happen, but okay, let's do that. We can't do that seven times to making offers to people who most likely are not going to do it because we will, in fact, run out of time. You will have a heart attack before we get to the day. Trust that we're going to say at a certain point, okay, it's now time to really batten down and get very realistic about what it is that we're doing, but that we will get there. And, and trusting that we do have a sense, because we've done it before, that we're, wa that we're looking out for your project. I'm wondering if you guys can speak a little bit about how the industry has changed um, since you first got into casting. Well, as the old Deuteronomy of the panel, <laughs> I, I feel most qualified to uh, respond. Um, a couple of things. Uh, technology has had a huge impact on what we do. Uh, I, I, I used to carry around theater indexes when I traveled just in case I had to like do some research or, or make a, a list at the last minute, you know, so I would I would always have a couple of theater indexes which probably weighed about 10 or 15 pounds in my 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 hand luggage. Um, and now I can do all of that, you know, uh, online. So all of the amount of research that I can do and I can get lost in um, everybody who's ever done an Athel Fugard play or everybody who's ever done a, an August Wilson play or whatever. It's like, it's just, that's like pure joy to me. Um, so the online aspect of it, the uh, tape submissions coming in, people, you can be in at Indiana Rep and send us a tape of, of a play, an audition, a taped audition. So that has been a, you know, a huge change um, in what we do, the um, I would say most of the technological changes are are really have you know advanced our field um, considerably. The one part of it that I think is um, everything has to be done so quickly. You know, read a play, send me a list, to, you know, overnight, all of that, and. One of the, I think casting is best when uh, we take time for reflection and consideration. And so, you know, rather than just making a list of every artist, you know, who is between 35 and 40 and fits the character description, that I used to take a lot more time with lists. And really, probably the only names on the list would be people who actually were absolutely right for the list. And now I feel like the list that people want from me include like everybody you know they just they want the list of everyone so that's the one thing that I think is a, is a little bit um I wish that we could go back to a little bit more time for projects and a little bit more time for reflection when I was Dave Cap's intern I remember filing cabinets we didn't we don't I don't have a filing cabinet anymore um I long for the day or no I long I wish for the day where we didn't have paper at all in our industry. I hope one day just to put an iPad in front of every creative team member with a stylus and be like, here. Um, so I'm personally working towards that so we're not having actors show up with their paper picture and resume, we're not printing them. Um, so I've seen that change tremendously but I hope that we continue to go a little bit more green in what we do because um, shredding is still a thing our industry does with stacks and stacks of paper um, and that's wasteful. Uh, but it, that's just, a tangible change of, of slowly moving away from uh, paper and pencil and moving more digitally in all things. Uh, and to piggyback on the tapes, um, because 
our industry's gotten more and more expensive, even in a developmental process, our ability to audition for so many things has gotten more and more limited. So, so many creative teams are relying on casting solely from a tape process and not audition on tape, but viewing tape. So we can't say put the scene on tape for us. It's what tapes you already have that exist that we can use to get a creative team member who's maybe less informed about the working actors in New York uh, on board with making an offer to that person. So I've spent just this, this week alone just living in the world of YouTube and 54 Below clips. And that can get very frustrating because what we're doing is the, the live and in-person project, but yet we have to make decisions based on YouTube. Uh, and I don't love that. And I, I wish we had a, a happier medium of when we can meet people in the room and when we can't. So we can hire the people in the room that are then going to be in the room with us. Yeah, and part of that is, too, the, the alchemy between actual human beings, how their ions interact and combine in a room is a great unknown until those people are in the room, right? So someone can do two or three fantastic tapes, but then you bring them in the room, and the director and the actor, you can feel there's this frisson, there's no al not in a good way. So there is something to be said for the fact that even though our access to opportunity has certainly been... Um, has been expanded because actors can tape. There's also something to, be, something to be said for being in the room with somebody and there actually being a process. And I think the other thing that I would say regarding how the industry has changed is um, casting feels a little bit more producer, not a little bit, a lot more producerial uh, now than it used to be when I first started. And by that I mean uh, there's a lot of projects that I'm sure, <laughs> I bet if we sat down and asked how many plays we've had in common that have been on our desks that someone's tried to get produced, quote unquote, with a star or a bankable name, and it can go from office to office to office to office. Bernie's had it, Terrace had it, I've had it. Um, and part of the job now is to help under, is to help a team when we can figure out which chess piece to move first, and where to move it in some ways. You've got this list of 10 people, I was talking about Nicole Kidman, saying, okay, we've got one month. You've maybe got three star offers. I've made offers to this person four times. They haven't even read the script. So my advice to you would be, don't start with that person, start with this person. This person's TV show is just canceled. This person's movie just bombed. They may actually want to come and do a play now. That may be a person that you want to start with. So it's sort of the, the old indie movie, uh, example of trying to get a startup to greenlight an indie movie has sort of trickled down to theater now in some ways. And I think casting directors can be very helpful in terms of helping a team uh, keep realistic but yet still aspirational uh, expectations. And I guess one of the other changes is the, um, the huge amount of television that's being produced today has had a huge impact on casting for the theater. Uh, you know, actors who used to be happy to go to Yale Rep for two months um, can now stay in New York and, and work in television and, and be with her family or sleep in her own bed. And so uh, that, that has had a big impact on my, my work uh, since I work almost exclusively in the theater. I would say one thing, too, for, for perspective or um, actual producers, I find it hugely helpful when the producer that you're working for actually does watch a lot of television, is aware of what shows are doing very well, who's, who's doing well in film, who's on succession, uh, shows where a lot of theater actors started uh, you know, the Dylan Bakers of the world, Alice and Janney before West Wing, that sort of thing. Because I think there's a lot of missed opportunities when producers aren't necessarily as up on really rich talent that also does have a box office uh, bling to it in some ways. So you're going over the list and you're like, this person may be fantastic for it. They just won an Emmy for Best Guest Feature and whatever in succession last year, but also they're theater trained. And if the producer, if you're continually, edu educate sounds like a patronizing word, but 
Um, if, if you're continually saying this person, let me send you real on that person. Let me let me send you some material. It just adds another step, and I think there's a lot of missed opportunities where there's not uh, a bank of knowledge that producers have in the area in which they are producing, um, where they could be seizing on somebody that they're not as familiar with as perhaps they could be. So I think that that's something that producers can do early on, is really you know, especially with the cable TV shows, where a lot of theater actors are finding work understanding who those people are. Yeah, and the wealth of having streaming and cable TV shows sort of booming in this sort of golden age of television is that more and more actors do have that box office appeal, are familiar names all of a sudden, and are yet still gettable for early stage developmental work here in the city. Um, there used to be a much smaller list of folks that had name value or would lead a press release on Playbill.com. Now, I mean, it's, it's the Wild West most talented actors in New York are getting their faces out there into homes across America because of streaming, because of cable, um, which I think is wonderful. We're finding more and more actors are getting the recognition they deserve and then become even more valuable in the theater process. If you had said Phoebe Waller-Bridge three years ago, a lot of times you're met with who? Fleabag? What, what possibly is that? And it's our job to know Phoebe Waller-Bridge. Again, this sounds patronizing, and I don't mean it to. It's our job to know that person either as you do or before you do, and to say, listen, this person, this is gonna come out, and this is gonna be really, really big, and your project is going to happen at pretty much the same time. This person may indeed be ascending to a level of, high, of household name or niche art name. And, uh, and, tr and that, again, is I think where the, the trusting thing comes in. You've hired me to try to figure out who's going to be meaningful at some point, even if they, or at the moment, and you just may not be aware of that person. All right, so we're gonna open it up for questions. So if you, I'm gonna ask them one more thing and then we'll do it. There are microphones um, on both sides. You guys running them? You guys are running them? Awesome. All right, the last thing I wanna know from you guys before we get their questions, really, really briefly, what do you love most about your job? Actors. I would say the same thing, actors and directors. I love hearing directors work with actors. I love hearing directors talk about their work. Um, yeah. Excitement and enthusiasm. A, a director recognizing, wow, that was really fantastic. That actor prepared and that was a fantastic audition. And also being able to afford access to opportunity to actors is thrilling and seeing what actors can do and seeing them get things, and particularly in TV, helping them make some money after years of not-for-profit theater work. Yeah. Living in the stories that we get to tell, uh, providing actors the opportunity to tell them. Um, I always say like we get to be Santa Claus. We get to call the agent or call the actor and say, great, you get to go do what you love and hopefully get paid to do it. Um, I think there's no, no greater joy. I also think it's incredible that everybody in this room we all get to take what's our passion and our hobby and make it our careers. Um, I have this talk with my husband all the time because he doesn't do that, um, of how utterly fulfilling it is that we get to take what we loved, what we, you know, this, we were all theater club in high school and this is what I do day in and day out. And so that's just an incredible joy that we get to live our passion. All right. Oh, he is standing. He is standing up. Pass it on. You also can just shout it out. We can hear okay. you. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, you're all great people. How do we, and you have access to the same actor pool. How do we, as a project uh, creative team, how do we choose you? Like, uh, yeah. I haven't worked with any of you. I have had two other casting direct directors that I've worked with briefly, but so do you have any guidance on that? I think Dave said, you know, the aesthetic is certainly part of it. Of are we um, telling the story? Are we going to help tell the story you want told? Are we on the same wavelength? Are we speaking the same language? But I think so much of it's like dating. Of you just have to have someone that you want to talk to, someone that you don't mind calling on the phone, someone that you trust. Um, a lot of it is, is not a tangible because we all have the same cell phone numbers of the same agents. Um, so it's not that, it's not access, it's, um, it's relationship driven, both with us and the story and us with you. In the back. 
Stand up works, I guess. Stand up works, Mashiach. I hope to come away with an answer to a question that I've had. Um, for, for whatever reason it is, it seems that more and more shows that I've been going to, the chemistry between the leads, not just the two people, but the leads on, on stage is not there. And when it's not there, they're not connecting with each other, and they're not connecting with me. And I find that I, want to, I leave. And I don't know where that comes from. In other words, I'm listening. I came to this, this because I, I know some of you. I've gone to seminars. Um, I don't know if it's the director, the producer, whatever, but why is it so prevalent? And what can be done to change that? I think it's a really interesting question. I think, first of all, what I would say with respect is that you felt a lack of chemistry between the two people. That doesn't mean that everybody did, first off. Um, secondly, you can't predict. You can't predict chemistry. You can do the best that you can, but um, it's sort of like someone setting you up on a blind date, and you sit across from the person, and you're like, "Why did this person possibly think I would have anything in common with this person, or that we would have a connection?" And I think, very honestly, it, w what you're saying can often be the product of star casting and the offer-only situation where you've got, say, two, uh, say you were casting a production of Cat in a Hot Tin Roof, and you offer Maggie to someone who's going to sell tickets, and you offer Brick. You, there's, not a, there's no way to prove empirically that those two people are, in fact, going to have that chemistry that you want. We, as casting directors, can send movies with that person with four different people romantically and say, well, here's them with four different men or four different women. Here's what they were able to generate. Um, but again, you can't predict that, and then you hope that at the first table read, the two people that you've cast, if there is you know, a combustible relationship there, you know, fool for love, that there's gonna be something that's gonna be exciting. Um, but you, and then if there's not, then it's the, uh, frankly, I, th and I think maybe you would agree with this, it's the director's job to help the actors fake it. <laughs> Generate as much as they can, that's part of their job, right? I sometimes work with some people that I'm like, I'm not really a fan of you, but you know what, I have to be. So I got to figure out a way to make this work, you know. So I think it's I think it's the same thing, and I do think it goes back to um, to commerce a little bit there, when mostly it's it's a it's an it's a result of two people who probably didn't read, who people took a flyer on that they're going to be meaningful and that there's going to be a connection. <laughs> so, two more, two more, okay. I, I, this is a terrible. This is terrible that I have to pick. Like I hate this. This is horrible. Yeah, right here. Hi, uh, my name is Aman. Uh, I wanted to ask: Is representation from an agency necessary to get in the door as an actor uh, in your uh, company? And uh, I graduated from a drama school, but I also migrated from another country to study. So to get representation for me was a little hard because of my citizenship status. And as that keeps changing, I think I would be signed in with an agency. But at this time, uh, it's hard for me to like get indoors with casting directors. So what are the opportunities for like people who are migrants or coming from other places and graduate from a, a reputable uh, acting program? Thank you. Well, um, as long as you know you're here, uh, at, you're on a type of visa or whatever that would allow us to employ you. That that's the main thing, you know, that we have to 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 take into consideration. I would it would be irresponsible of me to present an artist and then have a team fall in love with him and then have to tell the team, oh, I'm sorry, we have a problem and we can't, you know, we we won't be able to employ this person. So. Um, knowing that, that that we can do that, then I would say that, um, I mean, our office, we have a lot of open calls, and we sit at um, equity principal auditions where, you know, any member of Actors' Equity can sign up for a time. If you're not a member of Actors' Equity, you can take an unclaimed time. And I can't tell you how many times the casting director comes back from those calls and, and tells me, 
we had 18 people come to this call today. So for the rest that. of that That's day, hugely important. For the rest true. of that day, we could have seen any you know non-union person who showed up, and um, it, we take every actor who comes in seriously. We want you to be great. So it, at an open call, we're thrilled if you know we never. We consider those people in the same light as we consider the people who come to us through um, through agency submissions. So if you come in and shine in an equity principal audition, we're thrilled about that. We also um, uh, oftentimes will ask the actors we meet in those auditions to be our audition readers and and come into and so you know you you it gives you sort of an insight about the casting process and the auditioning process by coming into the room to read with other actors. So uh, attending those auditions is, is very much in your, it's very, can be very beneficial to you. Um, also, if it's a very specific project, like if you are a high soprano <laughs> and you write to me and say, I would love to be considered for Christine in, in Phantom of the Opera, you will get an audition. Like I cannot afford not to take a moment to see you because I'm, you know, that's always a need that I have. And um, any character that's extremely specific, the same thing would be true. You know, if you see that we are casting uh, people of a particular race or, you know, ethnicity or, you know, that we're telling a story about, about a specific group of people and you write to me, I will see you because I will want to be increasing the, you know, all of the actors who I know who are like you. And also, I think, and this piggybacks uh, to your your question, sir, about um, how do you pick a casting director? You can go onto IMDb or IBDB and look up any of us and see what television and or stage we've done. So that would go for if you're a producer and you're looking for a certain casting director. If you go and look at what I've cast. Maybe there's something in there that you see that feels like it might be aligned to the aesthetic of your particular project. And for you, very much the same thing. Uh, all of the offices in New York now, I would say, um, from big to small, are doing a lot more regional theater, a lot of uh, you know, Berkeley rep, a lot of the Goodman, um, just because of the economy. We all need, I mean, and because it's exciting to work for out of state theaters who don't care about star casting, which means that we are indeed at those EPAs. And if it's not me, it's somebody in my office who's very hungry. And you look at it and you say, oh, the casting assistant is there. I'm not going to go to that. Dude, everyone was a casting assistant at some point. And that person is probably more invested in coming back with someone that they're like, oh my God. I saw this great guy, and I think we should see him for this. I did the King Lear auditions for the Glenda Jackson. Um, I did the EPAs, and we did it on a Saturday. And this is no joke, 12 actors came. And that's a product of actors in New York looking and saying, ugh, I'm so sick of this kind of casting where it's all cast before it even comes. Well, you know what? You're right, that's frustrating, and I get that. Yes, we had cast 13 out of 15 roles. But I will tell you that three of those actors that came were actors of color who I've now brought in for New Amsterdam, the TV show that we're working on, a number of times because of that. Educate yourself about the casting director. Look at what they're casting. New Amsterdam, we are committed to inclusive casting across the board. I want to meet everybody. I want to meet underrepresented actors. I don't always have the time to be as proactive as I can be about it. So if you come to me, and make it easy for me to find you, I wanna find you, you know? So if that's snail mail, sending a pick and res with a, with a cover letter, and again, sir, same thing for you. I receive emails a lot that say, dear David, I'm a, produ I'm a producer. I have this property. I'm not sure if you're taking on new projects. I've, I've seen some of the plays you've cast and maybe listing a few, so I feel like you didn't do the same thing with Tara. Or, you know what, and you did probably, of course, that's your job. But speak to me personally and not just the casting director in general, speak to that person and tell me why you think I might be right for your project and that will separate you immediately from the pack. You saying, I see you're casting New Amsterdam. I've watched two episodes. I enjoy the way that the world is represented in that show. I think I could be on this show, blah, blah, blah. More of that. Last question right here. 
Hello, uh, my name is Jazz Jenkins and I'm an actor. So firstly, I'd like to thank you so much for all your comments about respect for actors. That really like means a lot. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's really nice to hear, especially from your mouth. Um, my question is, you spoke a lot about how the industry is changing throughout your career, and I'm wondering if you've seen any trends or changes in what creative teams and producers are looking for in actors, if you see anything new coming about in the past few years. I'm just interested in that. Well, one thing, I would say that um, diversity and inclusion is uh, those are values that casting directors have held since I started 150 years ago. And it's <laughs> taken the rest of the industry to share that value with us. And I think that's happened. And I think that um, diversity and inclusion are up at the heart of every casting conversation we have now. Um, and might even be one of the first things we think about when we, we look at text. It's like, you know, uh, it, how can this be as representative as possible? So, uh, and, and so that, that is a, a, a value that, it, that finally I feel like everyone is beginning to share with us. And I think it's incumbent upon actors uh, actors of color, actors in, in historically underrepresented or, and or uh, perhaps you perceive misrepresented um, <coughs> communities of actors that they begin, not begin, that they continue to storm the Bastille, even if you are not, even if it, I just heard from an actor with a, uh, with a disability saying, I saw a call and it didn't specifically say that you were casting from the PWD community, and I'm not sure if I should come. And it breaks my heart. And it's just sort of like, of course you should come. Of course you should come. You, no longer is it time to wait for your place at the table. right? It's time to show up at the table. And if someone's going to be, if someone is going to say no, leave, leave my table, make them say no, leave my table. You know, so I think it's really about saying, all right, there's no reason that I should not be attending this call. I'm going to attend this call. And I think for producers too, recognizing at the outset that that is a priority for you, right? Networks, television, you know, there's mandates. Theater is not the same way. I, I, I can count on maybe one, literally one hand producers who at the very beginning in their first conversation say, this is not just this is not just an aspiration or a hope. Let's be open to, we want this. We actively want this. And I think that is the next wave. If you look at people like Rachel Chavkin and a lot of the young directors, Sam Gold, that are working in theater, and then those people are going on to work in TV and film, and a lot of writers are going on to work, you know, shows like Glow, Succession, all these shows that are hiring New York playwrights that share this aesthetic. Let that be known that it's a priority to you from the beginning, and I think that sets you apart. Great, well, thank you guys so Thanks, much. Guys. A round of applause to um, Matt, David, Daryl, and Tara.